been brought to you by the letter R. So we are up to R, and how fortuitous is that? Because we just did a story about Star Car, one of the very first, if not the first, archaeological sites at which radiocarbon dating was deployed. So yeah, R for radiocarbon dating, or just carbon dating for short. Anyway, what is radiocarbon dating? So it's a method of absolute dating, which means putting an exact date or date range on an event, not just ordering it in a sequence of events. And it's become about as integral to archaeology as adding salt is to cooking. Radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating. Now it falls within a type of dating methods called radioactive clocks. And doesn't that sound like some kind of a scary mutant clock or something? Anyway, what it actually is, is a series of dating methods, some of which we've seen before, like thermoluminescence dating, if you remember that uh, episode we did about the ancient carpet tree. And what these methods do is estimate the age of something by measuring the radioactive decay. What's radioactive decay? That is when an inherently unstable atom, or more accurately, the nucleus of the atom, loses energy naturally over time, and that's called radioactivity, radiation. Now, no need to fear, that happens all around us every day. Radiation is not inherently bad or dangerous. Like a lot of stuff, too much of it can become a bad thing. <laughs> Sweetie, you really can't hold your liquor, can you? Anyway, lots of very common elements have radioactive isotopes. What's an isotope? Well, it's a version of a particular element that has different numbers of neutrons. You see, each element has a specific number of protons. That does not change. And those protons have a positive charge. Now, the number of protons the element has is the number you see on the periodic table. So there you see hydrogen with just one, potassium, K, with 19, xenon with 54, and yup, carbon with six. So carbon has six protons. However, each element can have different numbers of neutrons, so several versions of the same element. And neutrons are the particles of the nucleus that have a neutral charge. So these different versions are called isotopes. Now, some of those isotopes are inherently unstable. They lose energy over time, and that makes them radioactive. Now, I'm not going to get into the mechanics of why that happens. This is not a chemistry class. Well, losing their energy members called radiation, that radiation causes these atoms to decay, that's called radioactive decay, and the rate at which different isotopes decay is actually known. So what these various radioactive clocks do is they measure the amount of decay present, then they calculate how that long that would have taken, and then that gives you an estimated age of the, the item, the particle. Now, these various uh, radioactive clocks use different isotopes. Some use potassium argon, some use uranium, but radiocarbon dating uses, you guessed it, carbon. You are a genius. And it uses the carbon-14 isotope to be exact. And the half-life of that, meaning the amount of time that it takes for half of that to decay, is 5,730 years. This novel method was first published in 1949 by University of Chicago chemist Willard Libby. He was an alumnus of the Manhattan Project, so he definitely knew a thing or two about radioactivity. And in fact, Libby tested this new methodology on archaeological samples of known provenance, meaning stuff he already knew how old it was. And believe it or not, these samples, some of them are of things we've already discussed on this channel. There was an Egyptian funeral ship, a piece of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and a piece of charred bread recovered from the ruins of Pompeii. And it was a match. Just 
So as we talked about in our last news update, radiocarbon dating was very shortly thereafter used at the archaeological site of Star Car by our friend Graham Clark. And the rest is history. Radiocarbon dating became a normal part of the archaeological repertoire. And he lived happily ever after, to the end of his days. Well, not so fast. Radiocarbon dating is not a silver bullet. It's not like you just put the stuff in the radiocarbon dating machine and voila, you've got your answer. It, there are actually a few or really a lot of complications. So that's what we're going to discuss now. First, this only works on organics, which of course are carbon and hydrogen based things, usually living things. Now, as we know, organics, if they survive long enough, often become fossilized, so those can't be radiocarbon dated. And because we're looking at half-life of decay, there is a time limit to this stuff. After a really long time, the amount of carbon-14 remaining is minimal, so it's very difficult to measure that. Now, this is being overcome with newer high-tech methods of measuring the C14, like accelerator mass spectrometry, AMS, which are pushing the boundaries of how far back we can go using radiocarbon dating. However, measuring such small amounts of C14 raises the risk of contamination, meaning some foreign organics come into the sample and therefore mess up the whole measurement. This can occur before or after sampling, like if we're sampling a waterlogged context and that environment absorbs some sort of material that's from a different age that can mess up the carbon sample, or it can happen after the sampling, like in the lab. And of course, it makes understanding the archaeological context and the site formation processes even that much more important. For example, and this happens all the time, I've seen it myself, imagine you're excavating a cemetery area, and that has been acted upon over time by rabbits and gophers. <laughs> If one of those little critters digs in the graves you're excavating and leaves stuff that's, of course, newer than the bodies and the related material to them down there, your radiocarbon dating might pick up that newer material and mess the whole thing up. That's why when you're excavating, you have to be careful in your recording of any animal or other intrusions. Or as we discussed in the context of the antic Thera wreck, wood is used for a long time often in buildings and in ships. So the age of the wood doesn't necessarily correspond to the age of that site being formed or even the use of the wood. For example, I just visited these wooden houses in the Faroe Islands. They have been inhabited since the 11th century, so a thousand years. Now suppose after the zombie apocalypse, some aliens come down and discover these things and radiocarbon date them. They're going to come up to the 11th century. They're totally going to miss if they just use the radiocarbon dating that people are living in them until 2024. So you have to be familiar with the archaeological context and use all the available evidence, not just the radiocarbon dating, to really understand the age of the site. However, there was one fundamental misunderstanding, a mistake, that was made at the very beginning of radiocarbon dating as the methodology was conceived. You see, carbon-14 is created by cosmic rays hitting the Earth, and all living things absorb it from the atmosphere, and it was assumed that this happens at a constant rate. But no. 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 Actually, the amount of C14 in the atmosphere fluctuates due to changes in the Earth's magnetic field and that of the sun. We did touch upon this a few episodes back in the context of paleomagnetic dating. So at different times, living things absorb different amounts of C14. It's not a straight line relationship. It's actually a twisting curve. And this needs to be calibrated. The way that it's calibrated is using dendrochronology or tree ring dating, which we discussed in depth in the ABCs of archaeology. And as you remember, tree ring dating itself is a work in progress. So therefore, calibrating radiocarbon dating is also a work in progress. 
So when this was first figured out, all of the carbon dating had to be recalibrating using what's called calibration curves, which incorporate data from all over the world. But guess what? There are not that many labs in the world that do this. I think the number is in dozens, but someone please fact check me on that with the comments. And these different labs use different data, different methodology, maybe different curves. So even for the same sample, two different labs will spit back two different date ranges. And yes, you heard that right. What you receive back is an estimate of a date range, not a specific date. You see, radiocarbon dating is not that precise. So if you're just doing a single sample, you'll probably get a date range back of between 100 and 200 years. Years. So optimally, you want to radiocarbon date a few different samples from the same site. And it's important that you know their relative dating, so which is older than the other. Uh, and you would learn that through the stratigraphy or other archaeological means. Then you do a probability statistical modeling from those samples to tighten that date range. And this is known as Bayesian analysis after Thomas Bayes, who invented it. And that looks something like this. On research into nuclear waste disposal, the federal government, for only $500 million, or the cost of one B-1 bomber, could reduce the great solar panel by 90%. As Al Bodine... All right, I got the picture. Dead horse has been beaten. And there you have it. Radiocarbon dating, like so much in archaeology, it's complicated. Hey, if you like what you heard, give me that thumbs up below, hit that bell to subscribe, or if you want to support more independent archaeology content, consider contributing to my Patreon, where you can enjoy some exclusive members-only benefits and other goodies. Until the next dig.